Hi, how are you? My name is Ryan Hannett, and I am a writer performer. Uh, I do autobiographical performance work, and my show titled Hi, Are You Single? was done in the public theaters under the Radar Festival, which is why Andrew Kircher, who helped curate the incoming series, thought that I would be good at moderating panels because he said that I was charming and funny. So I'm going to try to do that for you tonight. I'm here with Noel Elaine from the Bushwick Star. He's the artistic director. And I'm here with Moises Kaufman, artistic director of the Tectonic Theater Project and director on your own as well. Uh, so let's join each other in a conversation of how did you make that? geared mostly towards how did you make the two companies that you are the artistic directors of, but certainly if you want to talk about your art in other capacities, I'm not going to stop you. So <laughs> let's begin with just a, um, a short description of your companies individually and what led you to the creation of those institutions. So let's start with Noel with the Bushwick Star. And we're going to use the microphones uh, so that, yes. Yeah. Great. I think, great. Uh, hi, I'm Noel Elaine. I'm uh, the artistic director of the Bushwick Star Theater in, in Brooklyn. Um, we are a uh, black box theater that uh, presents uh, new work by um, New York City performing artists in theater, dance, music, performance, everything in between. Um, uh, I, I fell into doing this uh, by accident. Um, I, I, I'm an a I was an actor and uh, I uh, was part of a theater company from my undergrad. I went to Skidmore College and um, after being in New York for about uh, four years, um, and doing work with that company and doing work with other people and, um, and whatnot. Uh, I went back to school, I went to, to Juilliard to study acting and over that period of time, um, the company kind of did a few things but then people started to you know, move on uh, uh, with their lives in different directions. But we had um, uh, acquired this loft in Bushwick where uh, it became a live workspace for the company. So it was, had been converted somewhat into a black box theater but people lived there which, um, turned out to be a saving grace for me in going into my fourth year at, at Juilliard. I had a uh, housing crisis and needed a place to live and mm. Sue Kessler, who um, is my uh, partner running the space, um, and, and, and now additionally John Delgadio, who's sitting right over there. You know, my, I should put my glasses on before I start pointing at people. <laughs> That's you, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, we... Um, Sue told me, oh, there's a, there's a space available uh, if you want to live at the Star, uh, which we were calling it at the time, and um, it's on Star Street. Um, and uh, I was like, I don't want to live, uh, I don't want to move in there. Um, it's like a mess, you know. But I, I was uh, in the, having a crisis moment, so um, I, it, was, it was convenient to find a place to sleep and put my stuff. So I did that and then very quickly started to think about um, this space and its possibilities and... and to make a very long story short, I just um, realized you know, the company had kind of come to an end and um, I was going to be graduating from school again and I just, it, it, felt, like, it felt like a very um, blank slate moment um, and I had a lot of interest in trying to create a new um, creative community and this seemed like a way of doing that. So Sue and I started talking about that and it, it was, we had some grand ideas, but at the end of the day, it was just about like putting it out there and seeing who wanted to, to use it and, and see what kind of, we've had ideas about salons or concerts or things, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty open. And then over time, it's, it's evolved into what it is now where we have you know, a, a season of work each year that we, we, pre we, we present, the, our model is kind of always evolving somewhere between presenting and co-producing. Um, so that's, that's, Wonderful. 
So turning that on was the greatest success of my day today. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Pretty good. So glad we could do that for you. I can, I can go now. Um, so I started Tectonic Theater Project in 1991. And I started it because I was very unhappy with the work that I was seeing around me. Um, and uh, I, I come from Venezuela, um, from Caracas. And uh, when I was growing up, we had a, a really wonderful international theater festival. So I grew up seeing the work of Peter Brook and Jerzy Grotowski and Pina Bausch. And that, that was my, my earliest experiences were with that kind of work, um, which were experimental theater companies that were really pushing the boundaries of what could happen on stage. Um, I was so ingrained in that world that the first time I saw a realistic play, I thought, oh, this is so avant-garde. <laughs> <laughs> there is a sink on stage and water comes out of the faucet. Um, and I, I often think that I, th I must have had the same experience that the uh, Russians had when they saw the seagull for the first time, right? Uh, that sense of, oh, this is a new theatrical vocabulary and what are its possibilities? Um, by the time I got to New York, 90% of what I was seeing was realism and naturalism and I was very bored by that. Um, at a time when TV and film were doing that so well, what was the theatrical vocabularies that we could continue to develop in the stage? Um, so this line of questioning led me to create Tectonic Theater Project, and Tectonic means the art and science of structure, as in architecture, architectonic, tectonic plates. And, uh, and the name came out of the desire to do a real formal exploration of what could happen on stage. and. Uh, trying to stay away from realism and naturalism and realize and, and exploring what is the conversation that happens between the audience and the stage, especially when it regards to narrative. We're very, very invested in narrative and we're very, very uh, invested in exploring new theatrical vocabularies uh, and new theatrical forms and trying to, s to continue to redefine what that relationship is. Uh, the company just turned 25 years old and uh, we're still schlepping all of our stuff around, so that never changes, and uh, that's it. Do you, it's an ensemble company, and you create, you're constantly creating, generating work. Do you always do one project at a time, or are you circulating lots of different ideas, and then whenever one is ready, okay, that's the time to... to yeah, the latter. Forward? I think right now we have five projects in development, so we, you don't... Know, it depends on which one comes through fruition first. And when, how do those ideas come to the ensemble? Is it something where you say, oh, this is an issue that I want to tackle, or this is a story I want to tell, or is there a different way? Uh, it varies. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that we're having this conversation today because today is the 19th anniversary of the day that Matthew Shepard was attacked. And that was an event that really immediately led me to go to the company and say, let's go to Laramie and talk to people. So that, that you know, sometimes something happens that captures your imagination. Um, currently, we're about to open a new play called Uncommon Sense, which is about life in the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was two company members who uh, had a, a personal experience with autism and they wanted to explore it. So they took to uh, the rehearsal room and they uh, created this piece. So it varies, it, it, it happens in many different ways. How we, we choose what we do next. And no, how have you as the company has evolved? You say now you have a season and it's between presenting and co-producing. So uh, what has that evolution been like? And as you've sort of taken on the responsibility of we're gonna have a season now, what do you look for when you're putting, putting things into your slot? Um, uh, what was the first part of the question? What is first, what? Uh, you you saying that it's it's evolved yeah. over the time since 2010. So what does that relationship look like with each yeah. artist? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the rule is it's always different because each. Um, I, I think at a certain point when we were evolving, we were trying to really you know formalize things and say this is the form, this is how we're going to work with people, and then we very quickly learned that we threw that out the window every time because every artist uh, has different needs depending on where they're at, and every project has different needs. Um, so the rule now is kind of um, to uh, to sit down with people and say, where where are we at? What do we what do we need to do? How can we 
to help this project specifically. But there are some like guidelines. I mean, we offer everything that we have to each of our seasoned artists. So that means you know, uh, lots of time in the space for rehearsal. We have a summer residency period, and of course, the performances. Um, we don't have any kind of like, you know, uh, minimum or anything that they have to pay. It's like, okay, this is all yours. Um, and we kind of started there from the very beginning when we didn't have any money. We thought, well, that's time and space are valuable things. And we have, you know, lights and sound and all that. And we can provide all of that. And then as, as time has gone on and, and we've grown and our staff has grown, we now, you know, we give um, uh, fees that we pay the artists per project. So we have like a certain amount of money that we can just put towards the project. Um, our staff has grown so we can help out in many different ways. Um, in terms of a fundraising plan and then just um, our production team helping in the space and all these kinds of you know, nuts and bolts things. But um, putting together a, a season, um, it's, a, it's, it's a funny thing because um, I find like one of the most exciting things about pr programming uh, is, is the intuitive nature of it. And that's always fun for me to feel like I'm making a discovery uh, a personal discovery uh, when I'm seeing something, or we don't really produce pieces. We we uh, we ask artists whose work overall we're really excited by what they want to make mm -hmm. for you know at the star. So finding work that's really speaking um, to me is really an exciting discovery. But when we do, you look at the season, you're looking for diversity in all ways and trying to strive towards that, um, and that has to do. The artists in the season has to do the type of work. There, you know, different disciplines, um, uh, and that's become, I think, more and more of a focus as we move forward and start really becoming, I think, more educated about how you how you do that and how you foster, um, you know, a diverse uh, institution that produces diverse work, um, and going from being kind of like a couple of form, well, I don't say former artists, but like, you know, performers who are running a space to saying how are we, how are we, um, how are we running an organization that has some kind of integrity and credibility? Sure. Well, you both are artists in your own right, certainly, but now also have taken on this hat of being an administrator, of being a leader of these uh, two major organizations uh, in New York City and internationally, in your case. I mean, it, Laramie Project is done everywhere, everywhere. Uh, and so what have you found to be, as with the administrative hat on, the biggest challenge for you that you have faced as an artistic director, and how did you sort of surmount that challenge? The biggest challenge? I mean, he doesn't have, you sh I, that's what I said, but if you <laughs> want to modify, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, I think that, I mean, be perfectly honest, I think the biggest challenge is also been one of the most rewarding parts of doing this, which is we are in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood and have been from from day one. Um, and when we started, I didn't really know what any, I didn't even really know that word. And now I feel like um, I have been, my, uh, it's been education for me over the past 10 years. Um, learning how you work with um, your community, how an arts institution works with its community, how you build relationships. Um, and uh, it's been a humbling experience and a really good one uh, for me to go through. It's, and, and, and difficult at times, or, cha or challenging on a personal level. Um, so I think that that's the most, the biggest challenge. Yeah. So. I don't know, I, I have been fortunate enough that I, uh, I, I have always partnered with really good executive directors and I trust that they will deal with the administrative part because I'm terrible at that. I don't have that part of my brain. I didn't go to, I didn't go, when God was giving that part of the brain, I was, <laughs> I was late. Um, so I have, but, but the thing that, that I find interesting about running a theater company and the administrative part of it is that I always try to have the work lead the, the, all of the, everything else. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it's a little bit what Noel is saying, is you start with what is the work, what does the work need? One of the biggest, the best experiences that I've ever had in development work was when we went to the Sundance Theater Lab. And uh, the reason for that was that they, they had this form, and the form was that you work three days a week, you work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then you take off every other day. Uh, and they do it for a pragmatic reason, because we're sharing casts, so the same cast that is in my play is in somebody else's play. Um, but what happens to you as a playwright director and as a company is that you work one day and then you have to, you have, you're forced to take the other day off. <laughs> and then you work, and, and what happens is that in those days off is when the best work gets made, right? Because your subconscious is working, because you have time. Uh, you know, it's not the most financially savvy uh, <laughs> format, right? Because you're paying people, you know, they can do it because of what they do, but. You know, if I went to a commercial producer today or to any producer and said, we're going to do a workshop of a new play and it's going to be three days a week and the other days we're going to be writing in our minds, they would not be very eager to give me money for that. Um, but, but what that taught me was that, that um, often the models and the forms that are uh, de rigueur, that are what's being used in the, in the culture at large, are not useful. Right? So whenever I'm developing a new play, I really try and start from what's useful. Is it useful to have half a day of video and sound work and then bring the actors in the afternoon? Is it useful to work with a writer for two days in a room without any actors? And the, you know, how do we do it? Instead, as opposed to trying to fit pre-existing models of development, what I find most helpful, you know, the, um, Andrew Schneider, right? Uh, do you know his work? Um, he's fantastic. And, you know, if I was working with him, it would be a complete, do you guys know Andrew Schneider? He wrote a piece called, uh, I, I, am no, I Am Nowhere, or I Am Now Here. Um, and it was really, really wonderful. And, uh, but it, 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 he needed to be in the room with all of the elements of the stage to create the piece. It wasn't, did you present it? Is that what you're He's cracking up? Who's it? You are. Am nowhere? I cracking up? Is that <laughs> I have no control over my face. <laughs> was I making a face? Yes. He he developed some of it at, at the start, but we didn't present it. No, but he's he's developed he's designing the show that we're working on right. That's so I, I, so I don't know. So when you ask about how difficult is the administrative part, I don't do it, so I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> but I but. think that what what is important more and more and more and more, especially there are so many n new theater companies that are really finding ways of working together. Lots of young theater companies coming. Yes, and I think that's a very exciting. It's a it's a very exciting moment in American theater because, you know, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were a bunch of theater companies. And then the idea of a theater company as a way to produce work kind of fell off. And now there's a new resurgence of that. And there's a real excitement that, that you're seeing it in the work. You know, less and less works are taking place in living rooms. Yeah. You know, but I think I was actually making, uh, smiling because I was thinking of, the f I was having a conversation with someone recently about this this idea of like where ideas come from, and um, uh, this friend of mine was saying someone they knew was saying that they have they they have moments where they don't have any thoughts in their head, and she was like, I don't think that's a thing, and I was like, I I actually think I I go I need I go into that state, <laughs> and I need to because I could be sitting there trying to rack my brain figuring what to do about something. But if I take a moment, which is so rare these days, I feel like to, to pause and just look out the window, nine times out of 10, that's when I'm like, I know what to do, you know, about the problem or whatever it is. It comes out of nowhere. And, I, and that's a, a, a freedom we don't offer ourselves. And I think it's a very scary thing to stop and kind of just let yourself sit. And I think there are two things about, about that. One is, you know, Mike Nichols used to say that when he was in pre-production for a film, he would only work half a day because the other half a day his subconscious was doing the work. So that's how much he believed in it, that he put it in his contract that pre-production days were only half days so that the other half day he could dream. Uh, and th the other thing is I other was- The other half day he could dream. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and the other day I was in the shower and, and, and we were late for a, for a, for a thing. And uh, my husband knocked on the door on the shower and said, we're late, we're late, get out. Then five minutes go by, he comes back, get out, get out, we're late. Finally, he knocks on the door and says, stop writing and get out of the shower. <laughs> uh, and um, so, yeah. All right, I think that's a good point at which to open questions up to the audience. I know 
that there is a young theater company in the front row, but I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> anybody have questions? We have an individual with a microphone. Sure. One moment. We're going to wait for the microphone just because. It's a small space, so I thought you can hear me. <laughs> We're um, live streaming. That's the reason. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for Mr. Kaufman. Um, I understand you work internationally. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about um, the differences you experience working in other countries other than uh, America? Um, it depends, but in, in Europe, for example, they are much more uh, ready to work the way that, that the theater companies are working. They understand that process goes first and then kind of administration and forms, you know, go second. Um, I, I think that it's interesting, right? The, I, I always think that, that in America, this idea that the most important newspaper in America, uh, the most important section of arts on Sunday New York Times is called Art and Leisure, right? It's one word, Art and Leisure, right? Or Art and Entertainment. And I think that, uh, you know, in Europe, in Latin America, there's a different perception of, of what is the relationship with the stage and between the stage and the audiences and what can we expect from our theater artists. Um, so I think that that's a, a still, I mean, I think, as I said, the new theater companies, there's a new, a new, s there's something in the air now that is very exciting about what can happen on stage and what can we do and what conversations can we have. Um. Hi, so you just mentioned um, the stage's relationship to the audience, which actually is what I had brewing in my head ever since both of you mentioned sort of inclusivity and including diverse experiences in your work and in the and in the artistry program, how do you extend that same inclusivity and diversity to your audience? Like I know, Noel, you're talking about feeling that like the theater itself is gentrifying a neighborhood. Like you're in Bushwick, one of the most like diverse neighborhoods in New York City. How do you how do you look for audiences who aren't looking for you? Um, is mm. I think essentially mm. my question. Yeah, it's been a really uh, amazing uh, process over the past, you know, five, eight years to figure some of that out, and we're still uh, learning. But I think the biggest lesson I've learned over that period of time is that it's it's predominantly about forming trusting relationships first, and giving opportunities to see work second. I mean, if there had to be an order that if you just say, we're offering tickets to see this show, you know, or, or whatever it may be, um, even if it's in Spanish, even if it's uh, free, even if it's for kids in the neighborhood, um, it's not necessarily gonna guarantee that anyone shows up. People show up when you build a, a relationship with them where they feel like they have a relationship to your, your space or your company or whatever it may be. Um, and I think in the past few years, we've really, <coughs> besides our after school program, where we're just um, you know, forming relationships with the kids because we're spending so much you know, months with them, um, we're, we're learning about ways that we can continue to build relationships in the neighborhood that have a kind of uh, more, uh, a, form a stronger bond. Um, and that's often through the artists we're working with and through the, the work that they're making. Um, and, as, and a big part of it in the past few years has been our staff growth so that we also have the capacity to, to do that work because it is quite a bit of work um, to get out there, meet people, be you know, doing ongoing communication and, and investigating opportunities. And like that's, that's, you need the capacity to be able to do that. So you have to figure out what that job is, how can we start to do that most effectively, and then, and then you just, um, and then talking to people and listening. You know, what, what, what are people looking for? What, what are the types of things that we do that match up with that? How can we continue to grow to, to further serve our immediate community and where we are? Hi, we actually are all currently in a production of the Laramie Project that goes up in the end of October, and so this is all a surreal, magical moment. Um, I'm actually playing you, so this is even weirder. Um, 
but uh, I'm so fortunate. Oh hi. Uh, my question is sort of just like with everything that's been happening since the Laramie Project, and apparently, in, and in recent events, do you ever find? Because you also you you said how um, you find what's useful, and with your projects, do you ever find and just are sitting there and think about the Laramie Project and are just sort of daunted and just thinking about how scary and relevant everything still is. It seems like after the 10 year mark, after 10 years later, after everything, like do you ever think about that? Well, it's bittersweet, right? I mean, obviously I, I am uh, thrilled that the conversation is continuing and that the play serves as, serves as a catalyst for that. And I'm also really depressed that it is still so often performed, right? Because it means that this conversation has not evolved as much as we want it to evolve, right? Today, Jeff Sessions passed another idi idiotic thing, right, about uh, religious freedoms, right? I, I always, you know, I think they're really good playwrights. They always find the most incredible ways of calling things poetically what they're not. <laughs> I mean, they have this incredible ability. Anyway, but, um, so yeah, so I, I think, but having said that, I think that the play although it deals with, with the hate crime at its heart, it is really about a community trying to come to terms with its uh, way of thinking. And I think that in that sense it transcends any one issue. You know, was Matthew Shepard killed because he was gay? 1,000%, of course. But he was also killed because he was effeminate. And th the definition of masculinity of the two men who killed him couldn't accept that, right? He was also killed uh, because they thought he was a rich white kid and they were, uh, you know, trying to rob somebody. And so it is about, of course, him being gay, but it's also about uh, sec um, gender identity. It's also about class. It's also about religion. It's also about all of the fault lines that are dividing our culture. So the days when I get too depressed about how relevant it still is, that's what I tell myself. Thank you. Where are you doing the play? Uh, it's a production through Marymount Manhattan College um, oh, at New York Library. Oh my gosh, yeah. what a venue. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> We're thrilled. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, I have one. What would you tell the person who was just starting out? What would you tell your younger self, looking back? Um, I would say, um, stay really, really close to whatever it is that, that launched in you the dream of doing this. Because as you get older and as more of the business part of it comes in, you tend to lose touch with that. Um, every time that I've made a decision uh, based on career, I've made the wrong decision. Mm. And every time I've made a decision based on what was it that I wanted to see on stage, you know, I would like to believe that I've made the right decision, even when it failed. I think I spent a long time uh, uh, making a lot of decisions when I was younger based on things, that, uh, based on fear, basically, and things I was afraid of uh, failing at. And there was a certain point in my life after I first moved to New York where I kind of like made the decision to stop thinking in that way. And that's when I started to like basically, I, f I feel like discover who I actually was. Um, so I would say um, don't hide from the things that are, you know, scary, terrifying to you. Um, we will all fail like numerous times, but you have to do that in order to figure out what it is you're meant to do in some capacity. More? Oh, there has to be. <laughs> These are titans, people. <laughs> Great. Yeah, uh, for Moises. Um, what, what sparked the idea moment work for you to basically pioneer that type of theater? Because I find it extremely interesting. 
And explain uh, it for the people who don't. Yes, understand. moment work is the, the, the kind of uh, process that we use at Tectonic to make work. And over the last 15 years, we've been codifying it, and we're about to come up with a book uh, that Random House is publishing called Moment Work, which is our, our process. And um, so we, I always thought of Tectonic as a laboratory, right? Um, and the big question for the laboratory was, how do you continue to explore, you know, what is theatrical and what can happen on stage? And as I said before, I was really disappointed with realism and naturalism. Uh, Oscar Wilde said this hilarious thing. He said that, um, that when Shakespeare has Hamlet say that the purpose of art is to hold a mirror to reality, Shakespeare is only saying that as proof of his madness. Mm. So mm. that Hamlet is so mad that he believes that realism is a good idea, right? Um, but so to me, um, w when we started working, we started to create exercises to ask that question. What is theatrical? How does the theater communicate? What, you know? And what we began to find was that when we talk about dramaturgy, we are always talking about uh, dramatic dramaturgy, meaning character, plot, development, action, all of these things that the playwright deals with, right? But we were interested in creating a theatrical dramaturgy, meaning how do the elements of the stage begin to participate in a theatrical conversation, right? So. For example, Tom Stoppard tells the story of a production he saw of uh, The Tempest. And it took place at a theater like the Delacorte, which was a theater that was outdoors. And upstage of the theater, of the stage, was a lake. And upstage of the lake was a forest. And uh, at one moment in the play, uh, Prospero um, says farewell to Ariel. And Shakespeare writes, Aria, uh, Ariel exits. Two words, Ariel exits. In this production, the character playing Ariel started running towards the lake at full speed. And when she got to the lake, she started running on the lake. So the stage designer had put, this, put these things on the lake, not visible to the audience, where Ariel could walk on water. And then when she got to the other side, she ran into the forest. And when she disappeared from view, fireworks erupted. So all of a, <laughs> so all of a sudden, Ariel exits becomes a, 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 a theatrical story about this character that can walk on water and becomes fire. And they found a theatrical way of, of articulating the, 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 what, the spiritual nature of Ariel, right? And to me, that, that way of using theater to construct sophisticated storytelling is really exciting. Um, Robert Lepage did this piece there were seven generations of people, and um, the, 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 the great-grandmother, the first person, was a survivor of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. And she had this wedding kimono that she wasn't getting to use because the atomic explosion had deformed her. Um, so there's this wedding kimono, and somehow in, in all, of the par all of the acts of the play, the wedding kimono makes an appearance. And the last of the seven hours of this play is the great-grandson of her, who is studying Bhutto. And uh, he's doing this dance, and he's in his underwear, and he takes the wedding kimono, and he puts it on. And he stands with the wedding kimono, and the wedding kimono was so long that it covered his fingers, and the collar was so tall that it almost went above his head. So he looked at himself in the, at himself in the mirror, and he turned around, and when he finished making that turn, inside the kimono was the grandmother. And then he turned around and inside the kimono was his mother. And he turned around and inside the kimono was him again. So, you know, as a playwright, I can write three pages about how objects have the ability to carry the DNA of our spiritual life, blah, 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 blah right? But he managed in one single gesture to articulate a very sophisticated idea theatrically. So moment work is the, the series of exercises that we created to profoundly understand what is a vocabulary of the stage. How do you create theatrical storytelling? And um, you know, I often say that if you're studying to paint, you don't spend two years r thinking about the painting and then coming to, you, you're, you start with the, with the brush and with the paint colors and with the canvas. And so moment work is a way to do that theatrically. So we come into the rehearsal room with an idea and then we allow the idea 
to clash with the theatrical elements so that these theatrical elements begin to talk about the idea. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's how that came about. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody said that talking about theater is like dancing about architecture. No, and sometimes it does feel that way, doesn't it? Now I'm thinking about like 17 different images at one time because of everything you just said. Go on. Um, could you both say something that you've learned about leadership? What did Melanie say just about an hour ago? She had such a great quote. Is it Melanie who said it? It was a she, uh, invitation, things about invitation. Maybe it wasn't <laughs> her who said it. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said um, that a, a, a great, and I really, and it, it, I, it resonated with me that a great leader is concerned with being right, but is much more that. concerned with what? Also concerned with being wrong. Yeah, even more concerned with when they are are wrong and, and discovering how they are wrong and learning from that. I thought that was hit the nail on the head. For those who didn't watch, it was Jacob Padron of the Soul Project who was just being quoted. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, and you? I don't know. I think that I would say two things. Uh, the, the question I often ask myself is, do I want to be right, or do I want to get what I want? <laughs> and you know, so I don't need to be right. Uh, and when I say get what I want, I don't mean get, I mean lead us in the direction that I want to lead us. And that's a really good thing. Do you want to be right, or do you want to get what you want? Um, so that's one, and then the other thing is, I don't think that there's any one style of leadership that works or doesn't work. I know a director friend of mine who's a tyrant. Tyrant, tyrannical, you know, really. But he gets magnificent work from the actors. You know, I am exactly the opposite. I want to create a room that people want to join, right? Mm. Um, and uh, I want to have a room that people, that inspires people and that nurtures people. But I think that over, over my life, I've seen um, that, you know, that there's not only one way to do it. This is sort of like a half question that's forming my head, but I, I was very, uh, um, I was very much interested in, in what uh, Moises, you were talking about at the Sundance Festival, which is like this weird, not necessarily commercially viable way of like being forced to have these days off, but like in these days off, um, in any projects where you're sort of able to daydream, where you sort of do the writing when your husband's, you know, when you're in the shower and you're writing in there. Uh, could both of you share if, if something comes to mind, something that would be considered a day off, but in a way where you are engaging with the world and not a work sort of way that has sort of unlocked something in something that you're working on. Does that make sense? What is the question? <laughs> I was, I, if, if, uh, I was wondering if you would share with us a recent moment where like on this day off sort of moment you're engaging with the world in a way in which un unlocks something. It's, I'm just sort of curious. <laughs> um, I was working on my play 33 Variations and I was at Sundance and uh, I was stuck with a scene that wasn't working <laughs> and I took an, and I, and I, and it was the end of the day, so I just lie in the rehearsal f room floor and I fell asleep. And I dreamt a scene. And the scene that I dreamt ended up being in the play, like just exactly like that, I ended up just placing the scene in the play. And to me, what, what, what there's proof that what we're talking about is not just, oh, inspiration comes from you. No, it's not that, it's this. Uh, sometimes the scientist explained this to me. He says, if you say, oh, I have that word in the tip of my tongue, but I can't think of it, right? Let me talk about something else, and then it'll come to me, right? And then you talk about something else, and then the word comes to you. So what's happening in your brain at that moment, right? What's happening in your brain is that part of your brain is still looking for the word. Right? Part of your brain is still retrieving the word while you're doing other things. And then that part of the brain that is retrieving the word finds it and brings it to the foreground. So we know you know, we know a lot about the subconscious. So we know that there are things that are happening that we don't know that are happening. So the question becomes, how do you allow yourself the time to do it? One big exercise that I do is when I'm writing a new play and I'm stuck, 
if I, if I go to sleep, please note that sleep is becoming a recurring event, <laughs> right? a recurring theme. Like before I go to sleep at night, I'm like, okay, I need the solution for this. I need to, I need to come up with a solution for how to do this. And I go to sleep. And invariably the next morning, I don't have the solution. It doesn't happen magically like that. But something has shifted. And a new do window has opened where before there wasn't a window. So um, I guess for me the question becomes, how do you continue to have a conversation with all the other um, systems that are at work? Yeah, I, God, I, I'm just, I mean, recently, I, 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 John and I were talking about this earlier, like it's been a really busy couple of weeks, um, so I feel like I haven't had that, I, I, like, at that point where you're needing some more, of sl some more sleep. I feel like sleep is, like, my present to myself these days, you know? It's like, oh, like Christmas every time I go to bed, you know? But, um, uh, and I feel like I, if I'm thinking about like moments of uh, uh, quiet moments I've had lately. I feel like it is there, like these moments of just existing, and like how much of a gift that is to like stand, on, like find yourself, like maybe like there was a full moon the other night, you know, like just like look at the moon and be like, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just looking at that the, the, the moon, and and just feeling. <laughs> the air, and isn't that, isn't that nice, you know? I'm not on my to-do list, you know? Um, but, uh, and I feel like the moments, I mean, I feel like for me lately, um, the moments come, th those moments come actually from talking to people that I, more and more my discovery process comes from verbalizing. It's just like, can't, don't know what it is until I start talking it out, and all of a sudden I just said what I, what I was looking for. Um, and I don't know, it's a similar process, but I don't know exactly what that is. I think there are a lot of playwrights who refuse to talk about the plays they're writing. I find that I write my best plays when I'm sitting at dinner having a drink. Because I, I speak about it, and you're right. You know. Uh, the other thing, David Lynch wrote a book called The Fish. What Catching the Big Fish, yeah. Catching the Big Fish. And it's a really good book that talks about meditation and how the bigger fish reside in the lower parts of your consciousness, and meditation is a really good way to get down there. Um, okay. uh, it's sort of follow, follow up. How do you, I feel like, how do you feel the different times when you can take a moment for yourself and not focus on your work? How do you differentiate between laziness and taking a break for yourself or just recognizing the time you need versus the time you need to like power through? Necessity and exhaustion. <laughs> when, you, when you need to stop, like you know that, you know, there's that moment. And then when you know something has to be achieved in a certain amount of time and you're focused on getting that done, that focus, you know, that, 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 that pushes you forward. I don't, I, I mean, I can't remember the last time I felt bored or, or like I was being lazy. And in fact, one thing I learned, I feel like over the past you know, number of years is that um, taking a break for yourself and allowing yourself to, you know, burning out is a, is a real thing. And if you don't take care of yourself on some sort of regular basis, whether it be like little moments in the day or just taking a vacation at some point in the year to, to recharge, the, you're not, you're not forming a long-term strategy, <laughs> you know? Um, I, don't, I don't function well if, I, if I'm too exhausted. So I, I just learned that about myself and I just know how to um, try to, you know, keep myself in the best uh, condition possible to, to get work done. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, who was it that said that all an artist ne needs is a good idea and a deadline? he said. <laughs> How do you balance your work as an individual artist with the work that you're doing for your companies at large? Badly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, not much. I mean, I don't, um, I only uh, work as an actor once in a while now um, when um, it's, it's uh, not completely irresponsible to make that decision and take that time away, and and when and I think also when uh, uh, 
hopefully that and like a project I really want to do both magically line up. So we did a show last year. Now and then I get the privilege of an artist asking me to be in something that they're doing at the star, which mm. is always a weird negotiation, just in terms of like two, two hats. Um, but that show is now happening again in the, at the end of January, so it's gonna be one of those balancing Anthony. acts. Uh, no, Porto. Okay. And Miles for Mary, but I'm not in Miles. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, but that feels like, oh, I wanna do this, like this is a great opportunity and a great show and something we made at the star. And, but I, it's taken a lot of, uh, there were years where I was like kind of slowly making the difficult um, process, you know, the difficult decisions about phasing out looking for work as an actor, taking work as an actor. Said there was a point where I was like, I'm not going out of town anymore, I can't do that. And then there was a point where I was just like, they we're doing this project and I can't take a, anything that conflicts with that and that just became more and more um, common. So I have like a kind of hope that in the back of my head that maybe we'll get, we'll grow to a point where I'll be able to like have more freedom to take on projects of my owner as an actor, but who knows? I think it, it, it's interesting, right? Because in the arts world, we always start our, our, our lives in any art form in a, a mindset of scarcity, right? Oh, I don't have a job. Oh, I don't, uh, you know, where am I gonna get my next job? Where, you know? And th there's a moment where hopefully it transitions and you do begin to get more jobs and you do begin, and your life begins to get more into the realm you want and then you have to change your mindset from scarcity to abundance. And then you have to start making very strategic decisions, right? So, okay, I've been offered to direct this play, but I'm still working on a new play that it's about to come to fruition, so which one do I take? And um, so those are the questions. So, it's, so thinking long-term and strategically becomes imperative. And I think this actually relates a little bit to your question before about advice. Um, I never imagined I'd be doing what I'm doing now. I always was just I thought I'd come to New York and try to be, you know, make a career as an actor. And that path turned out to be more difficult than I wanted it to be. And then this other thing came up and I started doing that. And that seemed to um, be offering much more abundance in terms of like the success we were having and the direction it was going. And I never, I think part of me for a long time was thinking, that's not what I'm, that's not me, that's not what I do, until I realized that I really, I, I should invest in this. This is something that's working out. Um, and so uh, I think, and, and people talk about this a lot, that in this day and age, it is good to have, a, a, you know, to know, to not define yourself as one thing. You're, you could be a writer, a, a director, a performer, an administrator, you can, you know, or maybe just a couple of those things, but like, <laughs> you can do different things and 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 figure out which one, um, it, you know, work works for you. I think it's it's really important in the in in working in the arts right now. Um, maybe always, maybe it always was. Um, and then it's been amazing to me how that work has now, you know, helped lead to opportunities for me as 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 a performer that I didn't. I don't know if they would have been there otherwise, so to follow the green lights, as they say. Yeah. Cliche, to follow the green lights. The green lights? Yeah, like, like traffic lights. Oh, yeah, follow the green lights? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're at time. So thank you to Noel and Moises for spending some time with us today.